Good morning or evening, Patrick. I hope it's not morning. How's the, how is our opening to the general public this week? We survived. There was a bit of stress this afternoon in the old Timbercon showroom, but we survived. It actually was pretty steady. It was nice. That's and everyone's good. pretty happy because they've been able to go and buy beer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You, you gone to a pub yet? Yes, I went and had a little drinky poo yesterday afternoon. I haven't made it yet. I need to get out. You I've just gotten the habit of not leaving the house, so... <laughs> you need a book though. But there's yeah. some nice things going on around Melbourne at the moment. My wife booked us in to go to the zoo from the twilight session, 4 to nice. 8 p.m. I think that would be very pleasant. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Should we do some wood working? I think that's a good plan. Thanks for joining us here at the Tiny Workshop. I'm John Madden. I am Patrick Holcomb, as always. Uh, we need to really work on a new intro, but we'll talk about that at another time. Um, tonight... We're back on our bench project. Uh, Patrick's been pretty busy. What have you got here for us? So we've got the bench top here, which last time you saw it was in two pieces. Mm. So during the week, I laminated them together and gave it a quick sand, but it was already flat because yeah. we put it through the thicknesser. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about machining that. What else is on the agenda for today? Okay, after that, we're going to talk about... Uh, we're actually going to assemble the base, which is sort of sitting over there. We'll drag that out later in the show and we'll start putting it together and I'm going to make the hold down blocks that fit into this trench that the bench gets blocked down to the frame with. Um, it's a good technique, you can use it for the bench, you can use it for furniture. I use the same thing for most yeah. of my dining tables, I try and use a hold down block rather than a, some other type of hardware. Really sturdy way to lock stuff together and, um, and then we're going to talk about a few other things later in the show but I think we need to get on with you showing us how. All right. How did you get such a lovely edge there? Okay, so a piece this thick, it's tricky to get a really nice clean face on the end. And it's important that it is nice and clean because you're going to be touching it all the time and don't want it to look crappy. So there's a couple techniques you can use with something this thick. And what I ended up doing was I did a partial depth cut I actually use my table saw, so you can put some rollers next to your table saw and you need to make yourself a cross-cut sled, or you can use a circular saw on a track, uh, but that'll only get you a partial depth of cut. And if you look carefully down here, you'll see that the bottom half here has been cut clean. That was the cut that I did with my circular saw. Sorry, I did, I did it on my table saw. You can do it however you want. I'm gonna use that clean cut as a reference surface to run this bearing along so that I can clean up this top messy bit in one clean pass with this spiral router bit. And basically that should mean that this top half and the bottom half are on exactly the same plane and beautiful and flat. Now afterwards it's nice to just give it a quick sand because usually they look slightly different because the router bit gives a different finish than a saw does. You and can just run a belt sander along there. Exactly, or, yeah. or you know, even it's it's not so much sanding that you couldn't even just do it by hand with sure. a block. So, um, a couple of things to think about with this: you don't want to be hogging off too much material to with a router bit. So you want it to have removed as much material as you can already. So, as well as doing that bottom cut with a circular saw. I did a top cut with a circular saw to take off any additional material because I don't want to be removing like a centimetre of waste. It makes the cut really messy and not yeah. clean. You'll burn out, you'll blunt your route a bit quicker than you need to. Heaps of vibration. Yeah. Every time you hit a thicker bit, it wobbles. You pick up a, a, bit, a gnarly bit and it rips it off. That's yeah. right. So even though my second cut on the top isn't a nice clean cut and it doesn't match the bottom face, I've taken off as much material as I can. I've also added a little block on the back face here, which is going to stop tear out happening. As the router bit rushes past those, the fibers on the back edge, if you don't have something protecting them, they'll all just blow right out. And so it's really important to put something there. Yeah. What, what sort of router bit are you actually using? So I'm using a spiral router bit. I always get this confused if it's an up cut or a down cut. Well, what's the difference between them? So an, an up cut, I believe, throws the chips towards the motor body okay. as it spirals around. A down cut throws the chips away from the body. And so what that means in terms of the cut that you're making is as the chips are being thrown up, you also have the potential of tearing out 
the top face. Yeah. So on this pine, it wouldn't be that big a deal, but on really hard timbers or on laminates, that really blows out in a terrible way. So by using a down cut bit where the spiral is pushing material downwards, we get a really crisp top edge there. So that's going to be great if you're doing any kind of fine edge work, laminate work. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't have to get the white paint out to repair that little chip. For sure. And even so. just plywood, I find if you're going end grain on plywood, those pieces always want to lift. So a down cut is perfect for that. Yeah. It just makes it so much easier. Yeah. All right. I reckon I'm just going to you hit have it. a way at can you, it. Can you pass me those muffs over there? Absolutely. So, thank you, sir. All right. It's going to get loud, everybody. We all ready? Action! All right, fantastic. So, what how much pressure was that? Yeah. <laughs> what you would have seen, obviously, is me doing two passes, and the reason I did that was because I didn't want to have to, like I was talking about, I didn't want to be forcing the, the router through too much material in one pass. So even though it has a bearing on it, you don't have to push that bearing against the reference surface. So that first pass just took off, I don't know, two or three mil. Yeah. And the last pass was riding right on that reference surface and it gave me a really nice clean edge that's well, well within sanding. And, and when, you, when you're doing routing like that, because of the natural motion of the, of the router bit, it'll, if you're pushing it away like that, you get a very tight cut. It's hard to describe the cut. It cuts wood. It, there is a chance for it to chip though. So to deal with that, you can actually draw the router towards yourself so it's cutting into the material so it reduces chipping but you'll notice that the router will instinctively want to drag towards you yeah. so and i would never do a pull cut unless you're removing very little material yeah because the potential is for as the router bit is turning into that material if you're also pulling it towards you and it grabs a big chunk yeah. that's when it starts to bite so i do use pull cutting quite a lot and one place i'll often use it is if i didn't want to put a protective surface on this back face, yeah. there is a way that you can do a pull cut around that corner to yeah, prevent tear out. It's risky though, yeah? You don't want to have too much meat there yeah, because yeah. if you do, that's where it's going to grab. Yeah. Well, that let, I'm going to feel that. That feels great. Just a belt sand, even a block plane along the end grain there. We'll clean that right up. So, um, yeah, I I'm mean, done. there's a couple other things we can do to clean this up. Like John said, a bit of a sand. It might be nice to put a little aris along the top or a little chamfer. Yeah. So that could easily be done with a router or, yeah. or a little hand plane. The hand plane, yeah. For so, sure. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and we're going to look at making that hold down blocks that hold this top to the frame. We'll see you very shortly. Hello there, welcome to this tiny workshop, tiny tips segment on wedges. Now, these are wooden wedges, these are potato wedges, like I've had too many of them, but we'll deal with that another time. Wooden wedges, I've had these particular wedges for, I don't know, 20 years. They're a little bit beaten up, that's lost the end of it. I've actually got about, I don't know, 30 of them back in the shed. It's hard to explain exactly why these are useful. They're kind of the thing, I mean, I could try to, I've been trying to imagine some scenarios where 
I can demonstrate why you need a wedge. I mean, one of the obvious ones is, say you have got, you want to, um, uh, you're putting a door in and you need to wedge up one edge, or you put a wedge under it and you up it goes because it'll drive it up higher, yeah? And another little scenario I thought was that, say you've got an awkwardly shaped block of wood, you can put a wedge against it, or a couple, to square up the two faces of the join so you can apply your clamp so they're bonding flat face to flat base. If your bench is a bit rocky, like this one is, plum, the concrete floor's not very flat, well, stick a wedge under it. They should hand them out at some cafes, I think. But besides all these particular uses, there's absolutely no reason why you should have a wedge in your workshop. Make them out of hardwood, they'll last forever. Keep them in your little tool tray or keep them handy. They're no use whatsoever, but every time you don't have one is exactly when you need one. Thanks for watching this tiny workshop, tiny tip segment on wedges. What are you up to? <laughs> I've done, what I've done is set myself a complicated task. So um, what I'm going to make, Patrick, is the hold down blocks out of this piece of pine. Um, for those who have who've emailed us and asked for the plans, or those who might be interested in getting a set of plans, just contact us here at Timbercon. Here's the drawing that's part of the plan pack of how to make them. So, and then... The corresponding piece of timber is the cross rail. We've got this deep slot. Basically, it looks like a block hmm. that is screwed to the underside of the table, and then it's got that tongue which goes in the slot. Like so, yeah. So that's the bit you're going to make. And so when you screw the block to the underside of the bench, it pulls it down on top of this cross rail. And the lovely thing about a block like this is that it will slide inside, we'll have four of these lined up in a row, and it allows the top of the bench to expand and contract. Because if you fix it down hard using glue or something like that, it can potentially crack, or it will crack at some point. When you see all those lovely mitered tables made out of solid wood all surround, they're gonna crack, because you need to let timber move. So I'm gonna make these little blocks. Um, I might and, just touch on that for one more second. The sure. reason that those, that joint will crack is all of the um, timber on the top is running in one direction. You can imagine my fingers are the lengths of pieces of wood. And they want to expand in this way, but they don't really expand much in length so that this cross member won't be expanding in the same way. And if you put four screws through that, mm. as this one either expands or contracts, something's going to break. The amount of force that an expansion of, of timber can put on a joint is phenomenal and it absolutely will crack. Nothing will stop it moving. It'll bend steel. So rather than making four, um, four and eight, so eight individual blocks, I'm just gonna make these as a run of eight. Now I won't mark them all out. I just thought I'd show you the basic breakdown. So they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're 45 millimeters by 45 millimeters by 45 millimeters. Here's the block that's that dimension. And I've marked out across the block, 45 millimeter sections, that's the length of each of the blocks. Now when I cut that with my Japanese saw, that's gonna shorten them marginally. But we're talking a mill, it's not gonna, it's not gonna kill the design. So I mark it on one side. Does it matter in which direction your tongue goes in relation to the grain? Well, you wanna go along the grain. You don't wanna go short grain. If your grain was, let me draw it, how did it like? If the grain of the timber was traveling like so, that is what you call short grain right there. It's gonna snap off. That's just gonna snap straight off. So you want the grain of the block to go along the section like so. So the wood grain of the tongue continues into the block itself. And you don't have any short grain. Yeah. So it, it just strengthens it. So this is a little bit of wood technology. We'll go more into that in the future. So I'm just going to mark that across there like so, my little 45 mil sections. In theory, what you should do is like mark them basically right around. Ordinarily, I would use a knife to mark this out. 
but tonight we'll use the pencil so everyone can see it and it's a bit dark in here as well now there's your 45 mil sections what I want to do is mark out this 15 millimeter section which corresponds to the width of this leaving let me just check it 30 30 so I'm going to use a scribe to do that I'm going to set that at 15 standard procedure set it to 15 tighten it up then I'm going to run it along that bottom edge like so always off the same face so you don't you know if you go from both sides you can you know screw that right up very effectively so there's our tongue effectively okay now these blocks need a 30 millimeter to be need to be set back 15 millimeters as well as per the drawing so and is that the 15 mil that goes into the that slot goes into the slot sure so rather than marking out lots of 15 mils i'm just going to set my ruler at 30 mil yeah at 15 mil either say so 30 mil either side of that main line oh yeah i get it yeah just to speed it up a little bit when i've had to make a lot of these i figured out a way that you can do it with a really wide board yeah. where you cut that whole um, section out on a router table yeah and then you can just lop a whole bank of them off in one go yeah okay. rather than actually like having to cut out each of individual thing maybe i'll um we'll look at doing a video on that in the future yeah so i'm i'm a bit too old-fashioned you know you can tell by the color of my hair so um i'm going to mark it like so because while john's doing that I might you slowly start assembling the putting bench. this together so in our next section we can show you what it all looks like. Now I cut all this joinery this week and um, it all went to plan. We kind of did it exactly as, as we showed you last week on, on air. Oh, that all fits together. Very nice. So I've marked out all these lines. It's getting a bit confusing, but maybe it's a good idea just to mark on there with a cross where the waist is. So you can see now how this is actually coming together. And there's the shape of each of the little blocks, which corresponds to the drawing that we have. So I'm just going to grab my trusty bench hook that once belonged to Carla and cut through there. Cutting down that line right till we get to the 15. Now we're making hold down blocks here. This is not high joinery. They, they don't need to be, you know, to the nth degree. They just need to really work. As long as they fit in that hole. That's the most important thing. They don't need the level of accuracy that other joinery does. Okay. How are we going for time? We're going for time, okay? Are they going? To, is that, are those bolts long enough? Look, they they could have been slightly longer. You can't get a 105 mil bolt though. And I didn't want a whole bunch of bolts sticking out the back. See that little this fine saw struggling on this pine. Okay. Do you want me to leave this out for you? Yeah, we'll be able to demonstrate that in a moment. So I've cut all these areas, these lines. Oh, that one's a bit, a bit crooked. Ignore that one. Um, now, now we can knock that block out just using our chisel. Now, obviously, this is using hand tools. Like you suggested, you could do it with um, a drop saw. Round table? Yeah, yeah. I tend to lean pretty heavily on my um, sliding table saw. Just push it. You got a second clamp there? Eh? 
Ratchet clamps. Love them. Thank you. Unfortunately, I've torn the back out of that a bit, so I'm going to try the other one. The joys of pine. Did it again. Disaster. <laughs> Doesn't matter. So if you're finding that you are tearing the backs out like that, you could potentially, I guess, you could cut a few relief cuts. Or sometimes if you really heavily score that, that back line, um, you might prevent that blowing out the back. Yeah, what a disaster. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The important point is that what we can do is just pick up that line in the centre. Yeah, thank you. And then cut that block off. Point of the bench hook that you're using? Oh, it just gives you a you can you can push against it. Yeah. In order to hold something in place without having to clamp everything down. And you don't even need to clamp the bench hook down. No, and then next to the upcoming series, we're gonna go through making a bench hook. Yeah, great. So we've made this little block here. And the lovely thing about this is that just fits well, it needs a little bit of a little bit of pairing, oh, demonstrating the bench hook. It's important when you make these little blocks that the meat of the top of the block here is actually slightly less than this distance because if it's more, you're not actually going to be applying any clamping pressure. Well, no, you need to be able to get that about a mil below. Yeah. And that's actually... Nice fit. Yeah, it's come up nicely. Just a bit of a breakout. Sorry about that. Coarse grain timbers. Should have gone for a hardwood, but we had nothing big enough in the workshop to do that. Looks like you've got enough there to, to pull it down tight. Yeah, and so we can bore a hole through that now. When we set the top onto the rail, screw up back through the underside of the block and pull that top down hard. And how many do you want on each side? I think four. Yep. We'll push one right up to the corner here. Yep. The other one will sit in here, one in here, one in here, and that'll spread that load right across the top. Fantastic. So that's a quick demo on how to make a block. Um, we're just going to clean up a little bit now and we'll be back for the next part of the show. If you can't get your drop saw to do what you want it to, let me show you how. So one issue you guys have with their drop saw is that they start to cut off straight away and then pull the blade out to cut wider stock. Now the idea is that as the blade is spinning, it's going to dig in and push out. If you start from the inside and pull, then the blade's gonna to want to grip, it's gonna to wanna to slide out, and it's gonna ruin your cut. So the idea is that you pull it out all the way, you drop it down, and then you push it in. That's gonna require the blade to push the timber back into the fence. It's gonna keep your hands safe, it's gonna keep your timber much cleaner. With narrower stock, it probably isn't as big an issue, but especially when you're cutting wide stuff like lintels, uh, you're gonna to wanna to utilize the entire depth um, that you've got on your drop saw. Let me show you what I mean. So this is the wrong way. And this is the right way to do it. Much safer, much cleaner. And there's no kickback. The second issue guys have with compound miter saws is that they never push down in the direction that the blade is cutting. They always push down laterally. Now the idea is that when you tilt it to say 30 degrees, you want to be pushing it in a 30 degree angle. You don't want to be pushing it straight down to the earth uh, because obviously that's not where the blade's going. So it's just going to rub on your timber. This is the wrong way to do it. the right way to do it. So this is set to 30 degrees. 
I'm making a 30 degree cut, so I'm pushing on a 30 degree angle. So I'm trying to go from here to here, as opposed to here to here. Because if you're pushing down uh, laterally, it's gonna warp the blade and you're not gonna get a clean cut. So you probably knew that, but it's always good to have clarification. I'm Jake, and thanks for watching. All right, it fits. <laughs> um, okay, so you have nearly got that together. This one we've got together earlier. Wow. All right. Solid as a rock. Good solid. <laughs> so we're just... Now, we're, you make sure you're following my little diagrams. Oh, okay. I, um, in... When I was doing all this joinery, as I did with the chair, I marked every piece that was going to go together to make sure. So this one has a little triangle with a line on it. That one has a triangle with a line on it. John's all lines up too. Ah, uh, look, it's mine's got a little crescent moon. Yeah, look, I get kind of creative. Okay. Sometimes there's stars. Sometimes there's numbers. Oh, yeah. When you're making and building and designing your own stuff, you're allowed to be creative. That's the whole point. Would isn't you it? like a nut and a washer? Yes, please. Now, one of these um, half laps, I actually cut just slightly too big. And so when I went to join them together... <laughs> Did you make a mistake? Three of them were oh, perfect no. amount of tension, and one of them was just a little sloppy. So what I did was I glued a tiny strip of timber in there and fixed it. And you'd never know, except I just told you. But there is always a way to fix things if you're creative. And well, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you've ruined the piece. Hand up every woodworker who's ever not made a mistake or made a mistake here. Yeah? I mean, I think half the time when you're working with wood, being, it's not making mistakes, because that's unavoidable. Should we rotate? Yeah. It's more about how to correct them. Excellent. Yeah, like, well, this is, this is like a, a finely tuned ballet. <laughs> Whoever thought about doing this in a tiny workshop? This is just crazy, anyway. Whoever thought about doing this live? <laughs> um, no, correcting mistakes. You're going to make mistakes constantly. At the moment when you least expect it or need it. Like, you're putting that table together, something goes wrong, and you're just about to put it on the truck and uh, get paid. I've, I've got a, a piece of furniture all the way to a client's house and then when we were pulling it out of the car, we damaged it and I had to load it back into the car, take it back to the workshop, fix the scratch and then manage to return to the customer's house the same day. I once went to an exhibition in Sydney and Tony Kenway, and is a, quite a famous chair maker from Byron Bay, had a $9,000 chair on display. And I know Tony, I sat in, oh, how are you going? And my phone scratched the chair. <laughs> anyway, he just simply got a little bit of wax, a little bit of um, steel wool, and burnished that up, and that was fixed. So, um, make mistakes, it's a part of life. All right, so we've got this frame together. Now, obviously, we're heading to rush a little bit here, but. That is what I call a sturdy little bench. It's incredibly sturdy. Should we throw the top on? Yeah, let's go get it. We'll be right back. It's a ceremonial moment. <laughs> it's like, um, right. Wow, it worked. You could put Hagen here. <laughs> He'd break out in no time. And so here's our little block that we made earlier. And just to illustrate that, that actually slides up inside the unit. And you can see, I don't know if you can see on that camera angle, how it, is, it fits up underneath the top to screw that top down. And anyway, we won't go into that. Now, what else has to happen? Uh, well, we've got to attach the tool tray, um, which is there. We made this, this feels quite funny. Yeah. Should we push this out of the way? Yeah, I think we need to get this out of the way. Is that going to... It's gone on the ground. Ooh, all right. Okay, <laughs> live television. Okay, so we made... John put glued these sections together last week, and then during the week I added this plywood base. 
Now, in the plans that you guys have, the base, I believe, is 19 mil thick, which will make this tray... No, the plans are 12 mil thick. 12 mil. But it's a long story. Anyway, long story short, our tray is not quite the same thickness as our top. No. Now, there's two ways to think about this. One way is that we meant it because we actually want the tray to sit a little bit lower than the top. Yeah. Well, we can illustrate that. <laughs> Imagine if it falls off the bench. It's very close to falling off the bench. <laughs> no, it'll be fine. Anyway, so that'll sit there. We might demonstrate a little bit more of this um, next week. But one thing I wanted to show you guys is when I glued the plywood base to this chunk of timber, I've actually left a tiny bit over there. And the reason I've done that is because it's really easy to trim that plywood off with a trimming bit. Um, I won't do the whole thing, but I'll just show you what it looks like. Basically, this is a great way of getting all of these pieces to line up perfectly. So a trimming bit is a router bit that has a bearing on the end, and the bearing will run along the piece of pine, and the router bit will trim off that ply, and they just work so cleanly. It's the same bit, just smaller, that I used to clean up the end of the table there. Yeah. Okay, um, so, so next week, we're gonna be able to trim that up, Finish assembling the top. Attach this to the top. Attach yep. that to the top. Attach the top to the frame formally with all our little blocks. And then we're going to give the, 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 the bench a little bit of a finish. Like we might go through an oil finish that's suitable. Soften some of these edges. Soften some of the edges. And um, we'll then we'll look at you know how we're going to put the vice on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now a couple of other things we wanted to talk about before we go is uh, we've got a new segment coming up, and I think tonight's episode is quite poignant. Is that we're going to call this segment "What Not to Do." All right. Now we've all had disasters when we made things. I went pretty close to a disaster there. Uh, <laughs> this is a disaster, but that's okay. Um, have you ever really screwed something up? Yeah. Oh, frequently. I, I have one in particular. I made a, um, a custom wine rack to fit in a, a very particular spot in a client's house. And I had a selection of wine bottles that I tested for size, but I didn't include the large um, Pinot. Well, anyway, the larger red wine bottles. And so I made a wine rack that basically only fit white wine. And then I had to take it That apart. would make my wife happy, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, expensive mistake. I once um, was polishing a full-size dining table using a two-pack lacquer, like a Muratone product or something, and I sprayed it and I forgot to put the hardener in the polish. So it was just goo. It's just goo. <laughs> so you got to scrape that off now, and that took hours and hours and hours. But anyway, so we want to start a little segment called What Not To Do. It'll feature our dear friend Phil Shinbine. So if you've got any little stories out there about things that you've just completely screwed up, email them to us so we can talk about them on the show. So that's, what, what's the web address again? What, Tiny Workshop at Timbercon? No. Yep, yeah, that's correct. Tiny Workshop at Timbercon.com.au. Tell us your little tiny stories about disasters and um, you know, we, can, we can share them with the whole public, which will be really entertaining. Another thing is if you're watching along, um, we'd, and today this time's been a bit, bit of, uh, chaotic, but we'd love you to comment and we can yeah. uh, comment right back to you live. So yeah. we're trying to get better at that to get all that interaction happening yeah. and uh, just jump on and no, say good day. The possum is definitely waiting for your comments. So please engage with us and ask us questions. We're happy to respond. We're happy to share what we know with you and you know, we can have a bit of fun along the way. Now we were gonna talk about the survey that yep. we realized, but we've run out of time. So we might reserve that till next just week. Just know that we have read them all. <laughs> yeah, we have read every 91 responses. It was fantastic. Um, interesting responses. Let's talk about that next cool. week yeah, right. and how we can improve the show. So thanks very much for joining us tonight. Patrick, Thank thanks for coming along. See you next week. See you next week. Thanks for joining us here in the Tiny Workshop.